Well, good morning once again. Today is uh, September the 5th, 2021. Um, we're starting First Thessalonians lesson number 97. I have a, uh, a card here, a, a track. There's a conference at Ridge Farm, Illinois. Um, on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the September 10th, 11th, and 12th. And when you go there, it's a farm. You eat all the corn and you eat they, they slaughter a hog for the hamburgers and get it fresh done there, and, and it's great. And uh, so that's if you want to go there for the weekend, you know, that'd be a good place to go. Now, last week we ended up talking about our adversary, the devil, whom Paul calls the tempter. And uh, on your outline there, let's read First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this time in your word. And as always, I just pray that people hearing this understand your message of, of grace. It's a free gift. And just everything we talk about, just read down to your glory, because you're, you're the one that did it all. Thank you. Paul was concerned for the Thessalonians' well-being. Um, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, we're going to be talking about the devil quite a bit today. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had lasted 40 days, had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now the tempter here is the devil. Paul uses the word tempter in 1 Thessalonians 5. Let me read you Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, we're going through 1 Thessalonians, and we're seeing how they're persecuted and they're suffering and all that, and that's, that's the what people today who learn how to write the divide, that study the Bible dispensationally, they're not really in big favor with the Christian community. But we, we, you know, we know what the verses say. We're not looking for some big thing to make our life better. Um, that comes when you get saved. What comes after that is salvation, and you're growing in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding through his word. There's nothing better than that. Now, you can have 10 cars, 15 houses, but you can't take anything with you. All you can take with you is what you've built up in your soul from this book. So it boils down to two words, final authority. In your life, what's the final authority? You, me, your mother, your father, priest, you know, it's you. You, you take hold of the reins and you take control of your life and you get on with the studying. So, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Is there any wickedness down here? Are you kidding me? But we're fighting with the things we can't see. It's, it's a spiritual wickedness. Wherefore take you unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. A spiritual fight. It's not a slugfest. We're not going to punch each other out. Hopefully. It's, it's a spiritual issue. And we understand it that way. That's why when God makes a promise to you in hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promise before the world began. Before the world began is Paul's mystery, the revelation of the mystery. And once you get saved, now this is big for Debbie and I because we come from Catholicism too. And I got saved mid midlife. The, the understanding that it was a free gift, and that you couldn't lose it, was just amazing to me. I mean, that just bowled me over. And it's just, well, I, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. Paul uses this title for a particular reason, the tempter. Paul does not use the title Satan, meaning adversary. He uses tempter. Um, now, let's read a couple of verses here. In Ephesians chapter 2, let me, let's read verses 1 and 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, And you hath he quickened, that means to be made spiritually alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, 
wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So, if, if something is working in you, and it, you're, you're being bad, you're being disobedient, that's a spiritual issue, isn't it? How do you correct the spiritual issue? How do you correct something like that? Your thinking process, what you believe. You think it, you understand it, you bring it down to your heart, you, 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 you believe it, and you, you, you get on with, with life. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Let me read you verses 13 to 17. So in Ephesians 2, Paul compares what we were by, by nature. We, we have a new nature and an old sin nature. Our old sin nature is when we were lost. Okay? We still have that, but now we've been given a new nature. We've been indwelt by God the Holy Spirit, sealed unto the day of redemption, and we can make a choice now. Should I do this or should I do that? What's better, this or that? Well, you, you know what I'm talking about, but in Ephesians chapter 5, 13 through 17, it says, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Now here's my sign off verse. Redeeming, redeeming the time because the days are evil. That's what I sign off with. Why did I sign off with this verse? Because I didn't understand this until I got to be 41. I got to hurry up. I wasted 41 years of my life not knowing this. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, on your outline, this is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. That says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day, that's the day of the Lord, that's the prophesied trouble for the nation of Israel, the tribulation time period. As uh, Rick was up here, it's talking about, we're in this but now time period, but over here, you talk about the tribulation. Israel has seven years of punishment that they have not received it, they will, after we, the church, the body of Christ, gets raptured off the planet, sometime after there, after that. Um, where's that here? That day, you are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. What's that saying? We won't go through that time period. We're saved from that prophesied wrath. Lots of verses say that. That's not part of our agenda. What we deal with is when we get saved and we start understanding things and we see how precious this message is, and as you get older, you break down, all these things happen. We were given a promise by God, and he can't break his word. When you die, ask him from the, the body is to be present with the Lord. And we stay up in that heavenly place. We don't come back down to earth. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We are the heavenly agency. Um, back to your outline. If you would, go to 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10. Let me read you verses one, three through five. Second Corinthians 10, three through five. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. I want you to take that verse home with you today and think about it. For the weapons of our warfare are not, not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Take this passage home with you. Think about it. Read, more, read it over several times. Think about it. Find some other verses. Now, in Ephesians 4, 14, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. How, Paul? 
by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait. Now, if you notice the purpose of the Greek word means wiles of, the, of, of error. Um, if you go back, if you look at Ephesians 6, under the temple there, I got that Greek word there, it's the wiles of the devil, and now it's the wiles of error, okay? It's important to know, but no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now think about that. You're walking down the street, Somebody's lying on wait, right? They jump out of the mailbox and beat, from behind the mailbox and beat you up. But on a spiritual level. Isn't Prince, uh, Satan the prince of the power of the air? Isn't a lot of his thoughts and the, the desires running through people that, that don't understand truth? And can you be attacked verbally by somebody if you don't agree with them, everything they say? Sure you can. The, the, the biggest problem you'll have in, in being dispensational is other Christians. And... Now, the reason I brought up the word there, this is the Greek word methodia. We get the word method. So what are Satan's, what's Satan's method of doing this? He uses deceit and trickery. Now, this word is only used twice and only by Paul. You know how when we come across verses and words, that only Paul, exclusive to Paul. Now, we don't worship Paul. I'll get to that. Why did Paul do this? To be scriptural and not dispensational is the most dangerous thing doctrine in the world to be scriptural but not dispensational I hope I hope I woke somebody up there okay I hurt my hand <laughs> that paper isn't much of a I mean this is drilled in me so hard I could take my head screw it up and put it on again that's how a tempter cannot command you to do something he must trick you Use the sleight of hand to entice you to do it. Why? He entices because he doesn't have the power to command you. We have control of our thoughts and our actions. For example, if you see parents negotiating with their children, now, there's a lot of flavors to this, but for this, this is not a good thing. Why? Because basically there are two rules in the house. Number one, children don't make demands on grown-ups. Number two, life ain't fair. Get over it. When you're growing up in the house, you're under the law. Boy, I'll tell you that. There is a rule. You, you can't negotiate whether something's bit wrong or right. They tell you that. The reason for rule number one is grown-ups are in charge. You'd think... I could think of other words to describe the people that are in charge right now. That wouldn't be nice to me to say. If you teach them not to be responsible to authority, you will raise a rebel. Now, when I started off, Debbie and I, in, in this message, and I was rather rebellious growing up, um, and I thought about this a lot. You can be a rebel for the Lord and do right. If you rightly divide the word of truth, if you ever had that rebel tendency, right? Now, I'm, I'm not going to do what you say. I'm going to do it my own way. You know, most of those kind of people like myself, you become self-employed because you can do the work. You don't need a boss telling you what to do. So, you know, but think about that. This doesn't mean to be unkind to your children, but they need to be civilized so that they can learn. Now, this is an interdispensation. She's agreeing with me. I know that. Ephesians 6, 1 and 2. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, that the days that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth. This is an interdispensational truth. Why do they say it's the first command of promise? What's the promise? Well, if you do, if you do what I'm, t if I'm raising you. Let's say you're all, 
your kids. I'm raising you. I'm telling you what's right and wrong. And as a parent, I'm not going to tell you what's wrong. Hopefully. If you go out there and do things that are right, you'll probably never see the inside of a jail. You'll probably be a good, productive citizen. That's, that's something to shoot for. Now, on your outline, Ephesians 5.21. This is the first verse I use for those soon to be married. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, I know people, you know, they, they talk about being married and husband loves your wife as Christ loved the church and he gave him himself for the church and all that. And, you know, wives love your, see that you reverence your husbands and all this. But some people take those, those verses and they'll take other verses to try to say that the woman is not as important as the man. And if you've been married only for a couple of years, you see that that's not right. And when I found this out, I realized that your wife or your husband, if you're both saved, is the best body member you could have. She, I mean, spiritually now. If you let the woman tell you things that's on her mind as far as scripture, she will probably teach you things that you didn't. We only think a certain way. They think a different way. But they're going to do it together. You're going to be one flesh. And I wish that for everybody to have that. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd accomplish. The adversary does not have the power to control your life. You can turn your life over to him, but he is not in a position of power. He can't take away your position in Christ, but he can entice you to not walk in that position. You know what I just found out yesterday? You know the governor of California? Newsom, they have a new program now. They're going to pay. She doesn't like that. Okay, they're going to pay criminals to not shoot other people. A monthly salary. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think the shooting is going to go down? Ken and I were just talking about there's a lot of shootings in, in Chicago on 290. People come, you know, just blowing, you know. There's, the murders are up so high, it's unreal. But he's going to kill somebody and just say he didn't do it. Give me the money. I don't... I know that kind of thinking is out there, um, but it's just pretty bizarre. The, there's an old adage. The grass always looks greener on the other side, but it never is. Meaning, be content with what you have. It's hard being a parent. When you get to the point the children are grown up, grown up enough that you can't spank them, let's say you see something wrong in one of your children. You have to tell them that. You have to make them aware of that. And that made me think of my mother, because I heard her, when I, I had to tell this, something to my son, I started out with saying, this is going to hurt me more than it does you. But, and it does, but just to get him straightened out. He might have a bad character fight or, or something like that. And... When I first got engaged to Debbie, and my mother realized it was serious, she sat my wife down right in the kitchen. She said, I want you to know that my son is an alcoholic. What a thing for a mother to say. I bet you that hurt her to say that. I'm sure it did. So then I had the opportunity when I was, you know. Now, the first enticement in the Bible is recorded in the book of is with Eve. Genesis 3, verses, verse 5. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. See that word gods there? It's not capitalized, is it? God won't accept man's goodness. He won't accept man's evil. There's none good, no, not one, none righteous. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The two extremes of good is self-righteousness and then human viewpoint. Self-righteousness and human... God won't accept either of those. And if, you, if in the evil, let me give you the verse here, you see in Genesis 6.15, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's why Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
The Lord says in the next verse, I, the Lord, search the hearts. He can read the thoughts and intents of our heart. Satan can't do that. He doesn't have the power. He's out there enticing you to look away from this, to give, push you off the track, to go do something that's, that's not right. Now, let's go to some pad. Go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, verses 15 through 17. Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall re reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. They already attained, they're at a certain level of understanding, but they still have more to go. Because the more you learn about this book, the more you realize how little you know it. When I graduated from grade school of the Bible, my first thought was, I don't know, squat. Look at the next verse now. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which, which walk as, so as ye have us for an example. Paul is the only apostle in the New Testament who says, follow me. I just read, be followers of me. 1 Corinthians 4.16, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. No other apostle said this. In Matthew through John, Jesus Christ says, follow me 17 times. When you come to Paul, he says it more than three times. If you follow Paul, you're following Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. If you don't want to believe that, then you don't want to believe your Bible. It's that simple. We don't worship Paul. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let me read you verses 6 through 8. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out except your knowledge. Therefore, and having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. So godliness and contentment are great gain. They go hand in hand. They are inseparable. If you're saved, you got saved, would that make you a little more content in life? Sure would. Why would somebody come along and say you can't, you can't, understand, you can't do that? You can't feel that way. You can't know. But we do know. Go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4. And let me read you verses 1 to 7. Paul disavows deceit in his preaching. 2 Corinthians 4. 1 to 7. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. What is the mercy they received? Salvation. He didn't give them a new body. They were, they're going to get it when they go to be with the Lord. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. When you teach Pauline truth, you give them verse after verse after verse, and that gets people upset, other Christians. We're not being deceitful. We're not being dishonest. We're being, our final authority is the word of God, and show your verses to prove it. And if the other people don't want to believe, it's on them. I hope they're saved. But if our gospel would be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world, this is spiritual now, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of, the, out of darkness 
hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the ex excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Rick was talking about this. The down payment, the earnest money. When we were indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit, and sealed, that was the down payment from God. You're going to be in heaven. You're saved. You don't go to hell. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. One to six. Would to God ye, ye could bear my, with me a little while in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, more than one gospel in the Bible, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Paul's love of concern for the Corinthians forces to tell them of his own accomplishments. Paul also serves as, the, as an equal with any of the chief apostles. Okay? This should bring up Galatians 2, verses 7 and 9 in your mind. Let's go to Galatians 2 and read 7 and 9. Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. Now, it's the, the, this is the, happening in Acts 15. It's the council at Jerusalem. Something has changed in the book of Acts. It's gone from the dispensation of the law to the dispensation of grace. It's gone from the gospel of the kingdom to the gospel of the grace of God. It's gone from Peter to Paul, from Moses to Paul. No longer under the law, we're under grace. That's the change, and that's the mystery. So, Paul tells the chief apostles, here's what they say. Paul says, But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the, of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, are no longer pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of the fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they entered their circumcision. Now, when you come into the dispensation of grace, God takes away a lot of distinctions. You're neither a Jew or a Gentile. You're neither male or, or, or female. Okay? You're not, you know, he says, everybody gets an equal chance to receive, to accept this free gift. There's no longer differences right now. He, he, because he's, in, in, for the last 2,000 years, this has been going on, and most Christians don't understand this. That's your outline. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 to 15. Now, people who come along and want to say that dispensationalism is a nasty swear word, or you know right, get out of here, shoot me, I'll shoot you with a gun, I can't stand the thought of it. These verses are for them. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Is there any such office today as an apostle? No. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Paul now describes the lost, the religious unsaved, and the saved who do not rightly divide the word of truth. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, Three, he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now this is the only time Paul says this. He's the only one to say this. 
What would our teachers have been itching ears? There are believers who are not grounded in Pauline truth. They're saved. Who do not rightly divide the word of truth, who do not study the Bible dispensationally, who do not believe that there's, there's more than one gospel in the Bible, more than one church in the Bible, more than one dispensation, God's use of more, more than one agency, a little leaven will leaven the lump. Now, if you go to 1 Corinthians 15, what Greg, what Rick said, he read first, the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to get that and then um, Luke chapter 9 and then Luke 18. So get Luke 9 and Luke 18. And here we go. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Now this is twice you're hearing it today. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, Luke chapter 9. Now, what I read in Corinthians is about 25 years after Luke 9. Luke chapter 9, verses, chapter verse 1. Now, these are the 12 apostles. It's the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. He's dealing with Jews, the circumcision. Okay? Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Wouldn't that be great if that's going on now? And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, when Rick was up there, he quoted that first. Thy kingdom come that will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. I quoted that first many times in the Catholic Church. Israel's kingdom is going to come from heaven, come down here, but only after the tribulation. Look at verse 9. Save time. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Number one, question. Were they preaching the gospel? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Are you sure about that? They're preaching the gospel, right? Now go to Luke 18. This is two years later in time now. Okay, two years later, and still the earthly ministry of Christ, they're still under the law. He's still dealing with the nation of Israel. Look at verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. All things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man. For he shall be delivered in, unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on, and they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Now what did they do after that? Did they jump up and down, clapping him on the back? Look at the next verse. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. So let me make my point. Earthly ministry of Christ. He's there for the nation of Israel. They're preaching something called the gospel of the kingdom. When Christ gets to the end of his time with them, he tells them he has to go to the cross and be spitefully entreated and killed. They didn't know, understand, or believe. Now you know about the, the Messiah being killed in the Old Testament, okay? And raising up again. But the mystery of the cross, the preaching of the cross, the, intent, the revelation of the mystery, that was not preached. They didn't know anything about that. When you get into Acts, it's still the circumcision, early Acts. That change comes in the book of Acts. It goes from, from Israel to, to the Gentiles, from Peter to Paul. It makes a change right there. Again, they were preaching the gospel. They were doing miracles because it's Israel's sign. You know, they're the sign nation. But they didn't know Christ was going to go and be crucified, let alone buried and rise again the third day. But he did that. In the early part of books of Acts, God gave the nation one more year to believe that he was her prophesied Messiah. 
And what did they end up doing? They ended up killing Stephen. In Acts chapter 7. Okay? What happens in Acts 9? Saul, Paul, got saved on the road to Damascus. The ascend of the Lord. Here's what I want you to teach, Paul. Throw everything else away. I want you to tell the people the good news of the shed blood of the cross. That's what scripture says. Paul says you need the whole armor of God to go up against the tempter. Ephesians 6.11, he says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand to stand against the wiles of the devil. Of the devil. A little leaven, that's scriptural hypocrisy, leaveneth the whole lump. One bad apple spoils the bunch. We need a thorough understanding of who God has made us in Christ so that when Satan comes to entice your old man, our old sin nature, there is something better of more value empowering you to withstand the pressure. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. When you come to Paul, you get something much better. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now again, think we're in a spiritual fight, not physical. It seems physical when people are yelling at you or persecuting you, but it's still a spiritual. 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. I challenge anybody to try to find these verses or these words anywhere else in the Bible. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, I'm on here 71 years, this is the moment, will feel like that when you get to heaven. It's like looking back at my life, it went away so fast, but going through it seemed like a long way to go, a long time. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, the things which are, which are not seen are eternal. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 on your outline, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, again, that's a positional term. Rick nailed it. We're indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit, that's God's earnest money, his down payment. We're sealed. Can't lose it, can't give it away. You can act like you're unsaved, but it's the promise of Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This did not happen during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ with the Twelve. Period. I'll give you $10,000 if you can prove it scripturally. And I'm cheap. You do not have a master-slave relationship. You are free in Christ. The law puts you under a master and a slave. Israel is under tutors and governors. They were told what to do, everything. Here's how to act, here's what to eat, here's how to marry, all these things. Paul says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's the law. Paul encourages them to stand fast in their freedom. If you do this, grace is actually like being self-employed for the Lord. You can go to scripture and you, you, you don't need direct commands from God. You can figure out what to do. It teaches you what to do. It doesn't tell you go here and the, the time, this time go over there and do this and that. No. I'm a man and I'm, I'm, I'm saved and I have a mind and, and, and a heart and I can go to scripture and read things like, like points me in the right direction to help other people. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. That she put off the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You don't have to fear Satan and what he can do to you. We can put off the old man and put on the new. There's a, there's a battle going on. It's a spiritual battle. The word devil, diabolos, from the Greek diabolin, to slander, attack. Dia means a cross between or through. And balin means to throw, like a ball. 
So literally, the devil tries to throw something between you and your walk with Jesus Christ that separates you from your identity in Christ in the practical daily living. So the tempter seeks to test. Job 26, 13, God created this creature. By, the, by his spirit hath he garnished the heavens. His hand hath formed the crooked serpent. That's the tempter. Definition of a crooked serpent, a fleeing fugitive. Now, Isaiah 27, 1. The things I'm going to talk about momentarily here fit in this time period. Israel's going to be, after we're raptured out of here, Israel's got that tribulation coming. Isaiah 27, 1. In that day, the Lord, with a sword and great and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent. The word crooked is like his character is described in that word. And he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. God's going to win the battle eventually. Isaiah 43, verse 14, Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. What's going on here is the prophesied destruction of Babylon. And the foreigners that live in there are trying to go to the ships to get, a, to get away from that. This creature has many names. Prince and King of Tyrus, Devil, Satan, Serpent, Dragon, Leviathan, Lucifer, Assyrian, Tempter, Beelzebub, Anointed, Cherub, Prince of Devils, God of this world, Prince of the power of the air, and the accuser of our brethren. And there's more. Prophetically, the Lord speaks of a sword in destroying Satan. Isaiah 49, verses 1 and 2. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people from far. The Lord, Jehovah, hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name, and, hath, and he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, and the shadow of his hand hath he hid me. Revelation 19, 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fiercest and the wrath of Almighty God. Now again, the verses I'm reading right now, the promises and the judgment God made to that nation, he's going to fulfill them. We don't become a spiritual Israel or spiritual Jews. Okay, they will get the punishment. We do not, we will not, the church, the body of Christ, will not go through that time period. Revelation 19, 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Like this is all the subject of prophecy with Paul. It's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Today, in the dispensation of grace, God tells us that we can defeat the tempter. Paul says in here, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves. There you go. There you go. You're self-employed there. They may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. They've fallen off the track now. They're following his will. But he says you can get past that. You can recover. You don't lose your salvation. That's what he's trying to tell you. And it says, and make this, instructing those. If I were to try to find faults of every one of you and come in every week and point out your faults, is that grace? I, I'd, be a, I'd be failing, wouldn't I? What am I failing in? I'm not looking at my own sins. That's what grace does to you. It convicts you of your sins so that you don't go around pointing out other people's sins. How can they recover themselves? With words. Paul says in Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation 
and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Since our fight is spiritual, not physical, it only makes sense to have a spiritual weapon. Now, you know, I go over all the time, Job 40, verse 19. Job was the first book written in the Bible. Speaking about Satan, it says, He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Now, what did Ephesians 6, 17 just say? Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You know what Satan doesn't like? He doesn't like truth. What did the gospel of grace, the revelation of the mystery, do to Satan and mankind? Well, it trumped Satan. When, when Christ died, Satan was at the top of his peak. I, I just, I, now I can kick, take control of the air and the, and the ground, the earth. Right? If you go to 1 Corinthians 2, well, I'll get there a little later. I got it now. I got him killed. I, I mean, you know, I got both realms. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. I can rule over both places. What did his rising from the dead do with to Satan's plan? You know the phrase, lead captivity captive? That means if you're the prisoner, you make them the prisoner. With the revelation of, of, of the dispensation of grace, the gospel of grace, the salvation of Paul on the road to Damascus did, was trump Satan. Kick sin in its face. I mean, that it, it's, it's, it's the only weapon today that can keep the tempter away from you. This knowledge. It's a spiritual short sword. You learn the words. You get it tempted in some way. You, you take the words and you try to avoid that temptation, whatever, you're, whatever it is. And we're all sinners. Had Satan known about the crosswork of the Christ, that it was going to be salvation for everybody, that Christ died for the sins for everybody, for all time, Christ would not have been crucified. Now, the contrast is seen in the following chapter. It's pregnant with Pauline grace truth. 1 Corinthians 9.1 Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? How many times, how many verses do people need to show that Paul is the apostle for today? The twelve apostles agreed to that. Jesus Christ agreed to that. And they refused to see it. In 1 Corinthians 9, let me read you verses 16 through 18. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, he was entrusted with this body of information. 1 Thessalonians 2.4 What is my reward then? A new Cadillac? A new wife? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I make the gospel of Christ without charge, then I abuse not my power in the gospel. Now, if you're under the law, under the gospel kingdom, they're looking for money. Bring your tithes into the storehouse, they quote Malachi. It has nothing to do with the dispensation of grace. Let's continue, 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Paul says, now think of this now. He's, he's, think of somebody that's legalistic, wants to know all your sins, wants to point a finger at you. Romans 2 deals with this. The first half, the self-righteous Gentile. The second half, the self-righteous Jew. You're accusing your people, and you're doing the same thing. God wipes them out. Paul wipes them out. And though I be free from all men, this is Paul's attitude. This is grace attitude. Have I not seen, seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Well, go to 2 Corinthians 12. You can see that. He was up in the third heaven. Are not ye my work in the Lord? I, I, I'm sorry. That's under, I'm reading the wrong thing. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant under all, then I might gain the more. I'm going to be a servant to you because I want you to understand something. I'll take the lower seat. I want you to understand something. 
Unto the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are without the law, is under the law. To them that are under the law, is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, is without the law. Being not without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. That I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. This is kindness. This is thoughtfulness. This is agape love. Esteeming others for themselves. You don't have to lord over, over somebody because you think you more script, know more scriptures. You don't, you don't have to feel superior. We're free. We can act and do what we want. God says love, grace, not law. So here's the passage that got my twin sisters interested. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. Paul says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. You can't find this out in the Old Testament of the Gospels. Which God ordained before the world under our glory. Paul says, be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. Get in on this. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Put on the armor. Stand in your identity in Christ and put it into actions to overcome the temper. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you.